Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I'd like to welcome everybody to worship this morning. I'm just going to try and reposition my camera a little bit. Let's help the feedback. Anyway, I'll get enough feedback after this service. I don't need it. <laughs> I want to welcome you to worship this morning at New Tiny Diamond this Church. And if you're watching online, thank you for tuning in Facebook Live or YouTube Live later. Uh, we do want to remind everybody that we do have our trans around in the parking lot. So if you're inclined to want to come in the car and listen, you may do so. If there's somebody in the parking lot, can you please honk your horns now? All right, not hearing a lot of horns, but we've had people in the parking lot recently. So I want to encourage you. If you're kind of on the fence and not quite ready to come back to worship, uh, parking lot ministry is there. Also want to remind everybody, if you've not been inside the sanctuary, we do, in spite of me having my mask off when I'm up here, I have my mask on throughout the rest of the service, and everybody here in worship is fully masked and distance, so it's a safe place to come. But as you know, we want to keep our options open. I want to remind everybody, if you're here in worship in the sanctuary, please sign the attendance pad in your row and then pass it down your row during the course, early part of this service. I also want to thank everybody for supporting the Little Pantry. As Jen shared last last few weeks, we've been really short of, of food and supplies, and people have been very generous in their giving. I also want to thank uh, not only Jen and her helpers, but also Ray and G. Gibson for uh, the new shelving that they put up uh, to help us uh, sort out our food. And finally, I do want to mention, uh, if you're thinking of bringing expired food to the church, uh, I won't discourage you from doing that, but I want you to know that we would rather not have to sort through it. We are going to throw out expired food, so please do not try to dispose of it yourself safely rather than bring it here. I also want to add editorially, don't bring us food that you hate to eat. <laughs> because if you don't like it, chances are probably most people, will, unless you're a little kid, then of course we're going to bring food you don't like. <laughs> anyway, thank you for bringing it. It's, it's a cold winter, and the, the little pantry is used all the time. And our volunteers are constantly replenishing the food and the supplies. So I thank you again for this very important ministry. So again, welcome to worship today, and I'm glad you're here with us. And uh, now I'll begin worship by saying, this is the day that the Lord has made. Let, Let us rejoice and be glad in it. In you, O oh Lord, I take refuge. Let me never be put to shame. In, In your righteousness, deliver me and rescue me. Incline your ear to, to me and save me. Be to me a strong fortress to save me, for you are my rock 
and my refuge. For you, O Lord, are my hope, my trust. My praise is continually of you. Let us worship God.
Okay, now it's time for the children's time, and uh, we all, we're all kids here, so. I want to think about, I'm thinking this morning, uh, when you hear the uh, passage of the Bible from 1 Corinthians that Robert will be reading a little bit later in the service, the Apostle Paul compares the uh, body of Christ, the church, to a body with all kinds of different parts. And we're going to go through the five senses today, and uh, anyone, could you name someone, one of the five senses? Sight. Sight. Taste. Mouth. Mouth. Speaking. Touch. Touching. Touching. Hearing. Eyes and smelling. Right? That's fine. Okay, well I was thinking about um, food. Thinking about food. I always think about food. <laughs> the thing with food is like, I was thinking about God made food for us to enjoy and we can enjoy it with all five senses. The smell of the food, the taste of the food, how, what the food looks like, how it feels like, and what it tastes like. And uh, so many times we have debates about, well, if you were lacking one of your one of your senses, which one would you miss? Would you miss your vision first, or would you would, would you lose your hearing? The vision and hearing are usually the two that everybody talks about. But thinking about food. When I think about taste, with the COVID thing, uh, one of the first symptoms of that you might have the, the, uh, the virus would be you lose your sense of taste and maybe your sense of smell. Now, if you ever had a cold, it's hard to motivate yourself to eat because you can't smell the food. And not smelling the food takes away your pleasure. And of course, you can enjoy food without vision, but if you have vision, if what the food looks like can really uh, change your mind about it too. Years ago, Dr. Seuss had the book. It, the book still is called Green Eggs and Ham. And I think every parent, we were no exception, we took out food coloring one morning and we colored scrambled eggs and ham green. And our kids just weren't enjoying it very much. <laughs> Alfred Hitchcock, the great director, once invited everybody to a banquet at his house and he colored everything blue. And again, not enjoyable. But God has made it so that all of our senses are important. And if, we're, if we lack any of them, and many people do over time, either from birth or with aging, uh, we, are, we, are, we are less on the senses, and yet at the same time, we only miss it because we've experienced it. And the church is a lot like uh, the enjoyment of food, isn't it? It's like when we come to worship together, there's a, we like to see each other, we like to hear each other's voices. Well, not, not so much hugging and, and that stuff as we used to do. But, you know, sometimes a scent of familiar perfume or aftershave uh, can remind you of somebody. It's a very special thing. The Bible says that every one of our senses is important, and God gave us five that we might enjoy. There's also the sixth sense, which is, which is imagination. Not saying dead people, but imagination. <laughs> imagination. Dreaming. And see, that, that's the greatest sense of all. We come here to dream about the kingdom, to envision a world where all people will be together, just like our all five, five of our senses. So I think whenever we're worshiping together, I want to remind the child and all of us, to just be open to God's vision for us. And let us model as a church, let's always remember every person here and give God thanks for all five senses for every person here and for all the people in the world we have yet to meet because the body of Christ is many members and yet one in Christ. Amen. Today's epistle lesson is from 1 uh, Corinthians chapter 12, verses 12 through 26. For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many are one body, so it is with Christ. For in the one spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves were free, and we were all made to drink of one spirit. Indeed, the body does not consist of one member, but of many. If the foot would say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear would say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, 
that would not make it any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the, hear the hearing be? If the whole body were hearing, where would the sense of smell be? But as it is, God arranged the members of the body, each one of them as he chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many members, yet one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the members of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable, and those members of the body that we think less honorable, we clothe with greater honor, and our less respectable members are treated with greater respect. Whereas our more respectable members do not need this, but God has but God has so arranged the body, giving the greater honor to the inferior members, that there may be one, that there may be no excuse me, that there may be no dissension within the body, but the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together with it. If one member is honored, all rejoice together with it. Please stand for the gospel reading. Today's gospel reading is from Luke chapter 14, rather chapter 4, verses 14 through 21. Then Jesus, filled with his power of the Spirit, returned to Galilee, and a report about him spread throughout the surrounding country. He began to teach in their synagogues and was praised by everyone. When he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, up, where he had been brought up, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it is written. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives, and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. Then he began to say to them, Today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Please pray with me. Dear Lord, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you for your wisdom. We thank you for Jesus Christ, our Lord. For in Jesus, you showed us what love looks like. So guide me in the words of this message that might draw us all closer to you and your vision for the world. Open our hearts and our minds to respond to all of your good gifts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, how long should a sermon be? That's always the big question, isn't it, Howard? How long should a sermon be? When I started out in ministry, uh, for some reason, uh, sermons were about 20 minutes. About 20 minutes. And as you recall, my sermons here, uh, they run around uh, 15 or so, maybe 16. We were on vacation, Sue and I, um, early in December last year, and we were with some family friends, and uh, one of the couples was very much involved in their church, and weren't, they weren't hesitant to talk about it, which is great with me. I always like to hear people talking about the church. And the woman was talking about her pastor and how much she loved his sermons. And uh, I said, well, how long, how long are your sermons? How long are his sermons? And she said, oh, they're about 40 minutes. And I looked over to Sue, and she was rolling her eyes, and <laughs> 40 minutes I said well you're probably probably teaching you scripture and all that it takes 40 minutes we once had a friend once uh, uh, and he had he has had problems in this year well, how long are your sermons so I, I like to have people about an hour oh. and uh, well okay well you can tell you can thank Sue that my sermons are as short as they are because <laughs> <they're gone. laughs> the old Johnny Carson thing cut it short cut it short 
Well, Jesus actually, Jesus was a big fan of the short sermons. I just want to mention, sometimes uh, we think Jesus might give long sermons because we think about uh, Luke's Sermon on the Plain, which is about a chapter and a half, or uh, the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew, which is about three chapters. But most of the scholars agree that the Sermon on the Mount and the Sermon on the Plains are actually compilations of teachings that Jesus had about the kingdom of God and other things. Jesus was not inclined to preach long sermons. In fact, if you look at his most famous parables, the parable of the prodigal son or the good Samaritan, you can read those out loud in about a minute. Now, the fact that those stories are so powerful, we, we, we spent generations, hundreds of years, people have spent reflecting upon those two parables because Jesus knew how to keep his message short and to the point and to give you something to think about. I want to talk today about the shortest sermon Jesus ever preached, and uh, it was just a few words. And I want to uh, lead up to that to basically, again, turn to Luke chapter 4, and we see that uh, Jesus is beginning his ministry. And as Luke mentions in the ramping up to his sermon at his hometown, it says that Jesus was filled with the power of the Holy Spirit and returned to Galilee, and a report about him spread throughout all the surrounding country. He began to teach in the synagogues and was praised by everyone. He had a really good start to his ministry until he got back to his hometown, and then things were tough. I would say, as a, as a young preacher, I remember I returned to my hometown of Sugar Falls, Ohio, and had the opportunity to preach there, I think, early in my ministry. It was pretty well received, but I, I do want to mention, I was home on the range, and because my mom was there, uh, there was never said a discouraging word. <laughs> I knew they had to face the wrath of my mother, and she was my biggest fan. Now, Jesus came back to his, his hometown, and they were very impressed with him, too, but he began his ministry there and startled them and all of us by preaching this short sermon. He was... Uh, he was handed the, the scroll of Isaiah. At that time, they preached from the scrolls. It was the Hebrew scriptures, and they had a set of scrolls there. And, and I, I think this probably was the reading for the week. And Jesus unrolled the scroll, and he read from the prophet Isaiah, chapter 61. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. End of the scripture reading, and now Jesus' message, he says, he stands up to preach, and he says, he actually sits down to preach, and he says, today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. End of sermon. Today the scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. End of sermon. And it was a powerful sermon because he was reading from the prophet Isaiah was talking about the year of Jubilee. The year of Jubilee where all of a sudden uh, the oppressed would go free, uh, land would be returned to its original owners. Um, uh, people would, would all be returned to a level playing field where nobody would be ho hoarding uh, fortunes or hoarding it over somebody else. It was a time of jubilee. Every 50 years is supposed to be a time of restitution and forgiveness. And because of the lifespan, I would say if you were fortunate, you had one year of jubilee in your lifetime. Now, the truth of the matter is, and I, I, I've questioned this all my life, and I, I, I've been affirmed. I always said, this is a really tall order, this year of Jubilee. Did it ever happen? Did it ever happen in the whole history of Judea? And the answer is no. The year of Jubilee never happened. Now here comes Jesus saying, well, today is the year of Jubilee. Today is the day this is going to happen. It's been fulfilled in your hearing, and I'm the one to tell you this. It's magnificent news. Magnificent news. And, of course, if we read the scripture more, and uh, next week's lectionary is, is going to read it more, but I'm not preaching on Luke next week. As we read it more, Jesus reminds his audience that there's going to be people outside of Israel that God's going to forgive, God's going to love. God is really serious. He's going to put other people, in many ways, ahead of them because they're excluded. They're, they need to be included. And this upsets the hometown crowd to no end. But I also want to say, forget about that later controversy in Nazareth. These words are big words. And this is going to create all kinds of trouble for Jesus. Because the world's not ready, not ready to see the kingdom of God. The world's not really ready to see a world without oppression, without divisions, without class, without distinctions. Because frankly, my friends, 
we kind of like the way things are. In our, in our darkest days, we complain and we moan about the way things are, but we're given the opportunity to complain and moan because we are privileged enough to have the time and the space and the means to complain and feel okay about that. Or to even take a stand for the outsider and feel, feel like we're helping them out because we are, we are coming down to their level. <clears throat> Jesus would have none of that in his ministry. Jesus would have none of that because he was busy loving on all people. He would spend time, of course, at dinner with the Pharisees, but he would also spend time with the publicans, with the, with the uh, prostitutes, with the beggars. He had people in his inner circle that were zealots fighting against Rome. He also had people in his circle who were tax collectors for Rome. He would not exclude anybody because his time was short. At the very most, Jesus had three years of public ministry, and he had to get busy. Had to get busy loving people, caring for people, proclaiming the year of the Lord's favor. And if you look at his entire ministry, this is what Jesus' ministry was all about. Letting us know that the love of God has no distinct the love of God. It's not. It's today. We, this, it can't be a dream deferred. It has to be a day. It needs to be now, because today is the day we have. Let us make the most of Toward the end of his ministry in Matthew's gospel, he'll say, he'll talk about, uh, you know, at, at the end of days, where, where God separates the sheep from the goats, the lion and the lambs from, from the goats. He said, you are serving me. You're serving God when you, when you feed the hungry, you visit the prisoner, you call the naked, you do the things that really matter. You show love to all people. Love to all people. That's a lot to think about. But if you think about the fact that Jesus says, today this is fulfilled, and if we really take it to heart, this is one of the most powerful sermons we're ever going to hear. Today is the day for me to show the world that God's love is real through everything I do, through everything I say, to the most part, to let people know that God's love is real. The world needs more of God's love and less talk. Elvis Presley once had a little song called a little less talk a little more oh, whatever a little more action a little less conversation i don't know what uh, elvis presley was talking about <laughs> he said let's get busy Let, let's start acting on things and it reminds me so much we spend too much time i think especially with social media and 24-hour debate and discussion arguing amongst ourselves arguing with other people talking about things which really require action I recently was aware of, as you were aware, there was a uh, shooting, uh, you know, the shooting and uh, bombing in a synagogue, and uh, the Jewish people are, are, re are facing a lot of anti-Semitism. A uh, recent article said that for uh, Jews 18 years and over, 25% of them reported uh, constant examples of anti-Semitism, people speaking out against the Jews. You and I don't need to be those people, but again, talking about debating anti-Semitism when we could basically showing a life of inclusion is more important. As we walk alongside the Jews, we also walk alongside uh, those of uh, the Islam faith, those of uh, the Sikh faith, those uh, who follow other uh, faiths, and even, uh, I would say, dare say, uh, atheists and uh, non-theists, we need to walk alongside of them. And again, too much time, too much talk is talking about, well, well what, what do we do about anti-Semitism? And the thing is like, well, if we truly love people, then we start working at putting an end to it. The same thing about racism. The debate about racism just drives me up the wall. These long debates about what is critical race theory? Should we teach it in our schools? I say, well, let's, let's quit finding fighting points. Let's find things that are gonna help us create a world in which racism does not exist but racism does not exist. All kinds of barriers, gender identities are also a, a touching point. Everything you can name is our fighting words and scenes these days. And you might say, well, what side of the fence are you on, Pastor Bruce? Where are you on these issues? I would say, frankly, that doesn't matter. I don't want to be on the side. I want to be walking alongside of all people, all people as children of God. Jesus, if anything, Jesus was most critical about religious people because he realized that, again, uh, those of us who claim to know and love God are going to be the first ones able to disappoint God. We're going to be the first ones capable of sinning against God because we know what is right 
and we choose to do something else. And it's only right that we should be most harshly judged, but we are also the ones who know that we are most fully saved. The world of, of today needs the love of Jesus Christ now more than ever. We cannot procrastinate. We do not need to wait. Recently, our grandson uh, received his first vaccination uh, for the COVID thing, and he was not happy. He's not happy about it, and he called, he called let us know that he did it, and we said, oh, we're really happy. Uh, thank you for doing that, and he just said, well, I cried and I screamed, which he did, but he took the shot like, a, he said, a wounded warrior. I, remember, I was a wounded warrior. And the thing is, is that he did that because it had to be done. He did that because it was no time to wait. And I think without, without hesitation, the things that we don't like to do, we procrastinate. Now, I know lots of times when I was a kid, I procrastinated going to the dentist. I didn't like going to the dentist one bit. I had a reason not to. I had lots of cavities, and, and it, it wasn't much fun. And I, I would procrastinate, and I, I would stew, and I would, nevertheless, I would go. As a grown-up person, I realize how much I need the dental work, and I take the initiative to go. Back in the day, I procrastinated because it was something I didn't want to do. Now that it's something that I want to do, I do not wait to do it. And you see, if we can just have a passion for doing what is right, we realize that today is the day we need to get busy. And the things that we love, we will want to do. The things that we love, we'll plan for. If you want to have a vacation or go on a cruise and you put it off for a while, if things seem like things are turning around and safe, then you get busy and you start planning it again. You don't put it off. If you don't want to do something, then you just dilly-dally and you set it aside. For a lot of people, unfortunately, uh, work, the workplace is like that. They're at a job they don't like, a job that is discouraging to them, and yet at the same time, they will go looking, living for the weekend. But if you love what you do, you look forward to your day of work, and you show up gladly because it's your calling, it's what you're called to do. So common sense says, if we love something, we're going to want to do it today. We don't want to put it off because we love what we do. Jesus says the love of God is just like that. If you love God, and if you love your neighbor, if you love yourself, if you see God's love is real, then there's no time to waste. There's no time to wait. Just get busy today. Jesus spent every one of his days spending time to pay attention to people but not hesitating to show us God's love. And because of that, you and I can take each day, including this day, today is the day the Lord has made. Let's be glad, be thankful in it, and let us remind ourselves that indeed, this is a day to proclaim the Lord's favor. This is a day to love all people. Let's be a people of God, children of God, and let the world know that they are loved because they see God's love in us and through us, for one another and for the world. Thanks be to God. Amen. Amen. Let us join now in the human response.
opportunity to share any joys or concerns you might have for today. If anyone has a joy or concern to share, you may uh, raise your hand and we'll let you share it at this time. Yes, Jen. Um, I have two. I mentioned uh, a couple months ago my friend Holly who was pregnant and found out she had stage three cancer. Um, baby Lyra was born on January 12th and uh, is in the NICU um, on a feeding tube, but also taking all her feeds by bottle as well. They're working towards that. So she's doing well. Um, and my friend Holly has about three more weeks. Concerns for prayer, rejoice. Yes. I have a joy. I had my granddaughter Sydney here with me today, and she was actually staying with us for a few days while her parents are down in Florida for a few days. Right. Glad you're here with us, Sydney. Thanks for coming. All right, other joys besides the Cincinnati Bengals. Yes. Yeah. 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 Joy, joy, joy in our hearts for the Bengals. It's, it's nice to see something and we can all get behind. <laughs> Unless you're in Tennessee. <laughs> <laughs> all right, other uh, concerns or joys? Well then, then let us pray. Dear Lord God, we come here this morning thankful for your love. Thank you for being your church. We thank you for the help that's brought us here, but we lift up today everyone struggling with COVID, including so many of our friends and neighbors. It's impacted our lives and our community so much. We pray all, not only for their health, but we thank you for the, the teachers and the caregivers and the nurses and the doctors and the police departments and the firemen, the first responders, the food truck deliverers, the restaurateurs, everybody who continues to care for us throughout this time of pandemic. We also thank you for an effective vaccine and we pray for our children and for the teachers we pray for everyone that we might continue just to stay the course, to pray and work for the things which will bring us all to greater health. We lift to especially Isaiah. We ask for you to watch over this, this child and keep him in your care as well as other people facing uh, health concerns. We lift up especially those people who are assigned uh, elective surgeries, who are waiting because of uh, possible delays, and we pray for you to keep them healthy and strong. I pray for my good friend Debbie, who is in the midst of advanced cancer and many involved treatments, and we pray for you to be with her and walk with her through her chemotherapy, just as sure as you walk with Holly and others that we know. We thank you for the birth of this baby on January 12th, and we pray for everyone this day with newborns or anticipating the birth of a child. We pray for peace and love around the world. We pray for our nation. We pray for the Ukraine. We pray for things that will make for peace. And by thinking about the Ukraine, we pray for our troops overseas and for ambassadors and others throughout the world. Thank you so much for your love to all people. And we pray for you to be at work in us. Help us to feed the hungry. Help us to clothe the naked. Help us to let the world know that they are loved. We confess to you that sometimes we, we hold back, sometimes we hesitate because it's more than we can handle. Remind us that you put people in our lives and other people to walk alongside of us. You're not asking us to do anything that we cannot do, but you're also reminding us that what we cannot do, others may do for us or with us. So give us patience, give us strength, give us courage, give us love, give us thanksgiving, give us freedom, give us truth. Lord, you are a rich and generous giver. Help us to receive your gifts, and then so give back to the world. In the name of Christ, and for your kingdom we pray. Amen. Amen. Now let us join in praying the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, 
as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And now, if in this church, as in many churches, we are not passing offering plates yet, but we do have the offering plate up front in the middle of the chancel, if you would like to put your offering there. Some of you also deposit your offering in the offering box on your way in and out of church. But as we gather together uh, for this time of offertory, um, we will let the choir lead us in uh, hearing one bread, one body. And at this time, to be silent, we can respond to God's love by reflecting upon what God has given to us and what God is calling us to do together. As we listen to the offering this morning, offertory this morning, one bread, one body.
for your great love and blessing over our lives. And for the abundant eternal life you offer through Christ. Forgive us for sometimes forgetting that you are intimately acquainted with all our ways. That you know what concerns us and offer refuge. Accept our tithes and offerings as a gift of worship to you. And that they may grow your kingdom. Establish the work of our hands and bring to fulfillment all that you have given us to do in these days. We pray that you would make our way purposeful and our footsteps firm in your goodness and love. Give us a heart of wisdom to hear your voice and your grace to be in our words. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. amen.